Hi, Lily. Thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I'd love if you would just to start, just share a bit about your background and your history and your life leading up to this point, anything that you'd like to share at whatever length you'd like. Yeah, um, so I've had quite an unusual background. I didn't go to school or university. And um, the reason for this is basically that I was um, brought up under a, a parenting philosophy called uh, taking children seriously. And um, the idea for that is that, uh, so um, there's this uh, philosopher called Karl Popper and he, he had some ideas about like how knowledge works and like uh, how learning works and how new things are discovered and stuff like that. And, um, and so uh, the, the founders of TCS like looked at that and was like, huh, like if, if this is true, which, which they thought it was, um, what, what does that mean about education? Well, uh, probably school is not a good idea. Um, and so, uh, and, and uh, it also had um, various implications like being uh, non-authoritarian. So like, like the basic idea is that, um, uh, knowledge is sort of like created when you are trying to solve problems um, and so like when you're you know exploring the world and like trying to address your own problems rather than a thing where like an authority kind of like gives you the answer um, like even learning uh, happens when you yourself are trying to solve problems and like there might be like an authority trying to give you an answer but usually this is more like uh, harmful than it is helpful um, anyway, so I did that. Uh, I, I kind of uh, like followed my own interests and problems and stuff. Um, and then because I kind of grew up around these ideas, when I was a teenager, I got interested in uh, philosophy and epistemology and like, you know, looking around like, huh, like lots of people have views that seem wrong. And this is really interesting. And this is kind of like quite different. And so I, I kind of got more into the epistemology there. Um, and yeah. What did your parents tell you over the years about why they wanted to raise you with that uh, educational philosophy? Um, it wasn't like a kind of thing where where they would say like this is why we raised you it was it was more like well because it's true like like because like obviously you should be able to do what you want as a as a little luli and um and follow your own interests and like that so that i guess there was like a conversation about school and that sort of thing and like kind of you know there are pros and cons of school mostly cons um and uh so that was more like yeah i don't know it just seemed like a really not fun experience to go to school when I could be learning myself at home a lot more kind of effectively um, and also getting better socialization uh, because like if you can interact with the people that you want to interact with instead of sort of random people that you're kind of like locked in this building with uh, that I feel like goes better. I actually did go to school for a little bit when I was 16 just to sort of see what it was like and it was like it was amazing how uh, the like like social interaction just felt really different compared with sort of home education because like it felt like a lot more sort of superficial uh and uh, and kind of like yeah and and because you never had any time as well like you always were like either in class or like you had to do homework and so like you had like and so it felt like a lot kind of like a slower type of relationship build uh compared with like what I was used to with with home educated kids mm -hmm. fascinating what what um, what did it actually look like for you? What did your education look for, like for you when you were interested in things? Or uh, can you tell me like a story from that time or what it might have been like for you? Yeah, I um, a story that I thought so like basically it involves like me following my own interests like you know take take any adult and if 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 they have interests then they'll like look it up online or whatever. That's like a lot of what I did. Um, I. I remember I got into uh, entomology, so like study of insects uh, when I was like seven or something. And so like uh, my parents, like um, they they hired this entomologist that, that had written the book that I was like really into. And like, he showed me around and like, we went to the, um, there's this uh, entomology department in the Oxford University, I think, um, and which is where I was living at the time. Um, and so like, I, I got to go and I got to see like people like pin bugs and stuff. And, and that was quite fun. And I, I, I think I even went to yeah uh, like an entomology convention at one point um this this was a not uh, lifelong interest I, I was sort of like over it by the age of 12 but it was still like a fun thing like I still have like stacks of these like bug life books or whatever it was called <laughs> what were some other things that you got interested in over the years 
Um, yeah, let's see. Gosh. Uh, so art is a big one, philosophy, um, more recently psychology, um, less recently, let's see, like improv comedy and I had juggling phase and uh, what else? Like, are, are you thinking like more kid or like throughout life? Because it, it feels like more con uh, continuous uh, with, for me. Yeah, I'm getting that sense. I'm getting that sense. Uh, it, it, it occurred to me like, mm, I imagine there might not have been a moment in time where it was like, oh, my education ended in the same way that it might for gosh for... what a horrible thought <laughs> yeah 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 were there any like um significant transitions or uh moments where things shifted in your education or like uh like a graduation or something or uh a point where uh, when... something shifted in some way yeah when when i learned to uh write and and read like read and write basically was like then unlocked the internet and and then i learned to google and that was also like i, I still think that most people are sort of deficient in googling it like there are so many things you can just like learn in like three seconds by by googling um so yeah so i guess like as uh like kind of through adolescence i was kind of doing more and more sort of self-taught stuff but i don't know I, I feel like i did that also when i was young but just in in different ways and with more kind of help mm -hmm. and tell me a little bit more about the socialization aspect that you were alluding to like how did you make friends and what were your friends like and how did that work yeah it was um so I traveled a lot. I've uh, I've been traveling back and forth between um, England and Canada since I was uh, like four years old. And so I kind of had different approaches. So in England, there's like, uh, first of all, it's like quite a small country. And so there are a lot of uh, like home educated kids like in a kind of like condensed area. Um, and also I think it's like more common here because uh, the law is better here than, than in other places. Um, and then in Canada, but like uh, also in Canada, there's, it's kind of like very safe to just like go and hang out on the on like in your neighborhood. Um, so uh, in Canada, I would go out and like play with the kids at the park and it was kind of all like, you know, the, the neighborhood kids or whatever. Um, and then in England, it was uh, a lot more like home educated uh, meetups like we had like ice skating on Mondays and we had like this like uh, camp festival -y type thing that lasted a week and, and we like hundreds of us would be there and, and that was nice. Um, and then and then and then stuff like um, I think things like clubs and like meetups and like you know, that, that sort of thing, mm. sort of depending on the ages and stuff and how 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 picky you are <laughs> at different times of your life of the children that were also sort of being schooled at home how many of them had to, to whatever extent you know how many of them had the same their, did their parents have the same educational philosophy or were there different like uh approaches that the other kids parents took yeah the, so um it's very 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 uh, varied so um, like like you get um, so mostly in England, um, as far as I know, it's kind of more like the hippie type. And then in America, uh, I haven't had a lot of contact with them, but like the more kind of religious type. And then there's the kind of more like in the middle or like libertarian or something, which is closer to sort of what, what uh, my family was. Um, yeah, so you, you kind of had all sorts, like you had the kind of the hot housed kids that were like very strict and stuff. I would say there's also kind of like different levels of like actively like helping kids with with, with the stuff they're interested in versus like letting them like play you know in the in the lawn or, or whatever um and uh in, incidentally that's another thing so the the taking children seriously philosophy was this kind of like kind of niche like a niche of a niche um and that was also a, a place that i met like other other kids because like there was only like a few of, of the families uh th that we knew anyway and so we sometimes we travel around and like meet these different people who kind of had like uh taking children seriously leanings hmm. what was it like for you uh being exposed to the kids that had different backgrounds or their parents had different educational philosophies versus the kids that had sort of similar approach to taking children seriously? Um, so like, like my reaction to the parents or? No, well, your reaction to interacting with the kids and their parents and stuff like that, if there, if there was anything that you remember of what that was like for you? Yeah. 
I remember I remember more of it when um, like when interacting with a lot more kind of conventional uh, like like the people in Canada. So uh, yeah, like like they I remember like trying to talk to them about taking children seriously and being like, hey, you know, you don't have to shout at your kid and like and 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 like talk and they, they found it like very endearing because I was a kid, but like <laughs> they didn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Like there was there was always a thing of. Um, like knowing that I have to sort of navigate those people differently and that they are like like coercive parents or like that they will do strange things like uh, ground their kid or like not let their kid play The Sims for two hours straight or something like that. Hmm. Hmm. From what I can tell from hearing you talk about it, it seems like uh, I I'm hearing like two parts of this philosophy. Like one is that you learn from problem solving and being curious about your own interests. And then also maybe as a byproduct of that, that like you should let kids dive deep in their interests. And just, if you're interested in bugs, then you help them with that. Uh, but, or just like let them go their own way if they know how to Google things or how to read and write about it. Um, but is there anything else about that uh, educational philosophy that that is missing or that feels important to share about it? Yeah, so I think at, at its heart, um, taking children seriously is about what to do when there is a conflict between the parent and the child, mm. um, or like any conflict. And so in uh, in conventional parenting, usually it's basically the like it fundamentally goes down to the parent, like what what like parent knows more, the parent is more experienced, parent has money, like and so on. Um, but in TCS, that's uh, considered a uh, an irrational way to, of dealing with with conflict. Like that's that's might makes right, and so um, so instead, there's a uh, so first of all, there's this idea that um, all of these problems are soluble. Um, like it doesn't it doesn't have to be like that that you you force people to do things, and that's just the way the world works. Like you can find a solution that everyone is happy with, and um, and taking children seriously calls that uh, a common preference. So a common preference is this uh, solution to a, a conflict that everyone prefers um, to like whatever their original thing was. And maybe that's like an alteration of their original thing, or maybe um, maybe someone had a misconception about like what's possible or like what the, the other person was actually proposing or whatever. And and so it's, it's very much like trying to um, come to a like a rational solution like like a and when I say rational I don't mean like kind of cognitive I just mean like not doing this sort of authoritarian thing um and like actually coming to a real solution instead of doing this force thing can you give me a real example that's not too vulnerable to share about what that might have looked like in your education like a conflict you might have had that was actually resolved in this way yeah, it's it's a little bit difficult to um, to to generate like uh, an example just because it's um, like when you're just in the the habit of doing this, then it's kind of like implicit um, a lot of the time. So um, and and also it makes conflicts like very smooth, and so it, it's not like ah there was this big conflict and then we did a thing and then it, it's more like you know we 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 talked about it for like two seconds and then realized that that hey there's this thing. Uh, let me see if I can think of any example. Um, and, and also conflicts come up way less often when you're in this thing and when you're like basically the parent is trying to help the child uh, by the child's lights instead of the parents. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, like it, it's really, really difficult to think of a, a specific like, like I have like stock uh, like types of examples like, um, I mean, OK, so this. Uh, this isn't necessarily uh, an example of of like a conflict between a parent and a child, but it has kind of the same sort of thing. So um, I, I was with a friend um, and we were trying to decide to, uh, which like fast food place to go to. Um, and uh, and I kind of wanted a bit of some like I wanted like a few popcorn chickens from KFC, but also McDonald's like cheeseburger. Um, and I think in in a lot of like parent situations and certainly of, of the friend, um, 
uh, you basically you'd have to pick one or the other, like, you know, th th that's, and, and then someone would be unhappy. Um, in this case, half of me would be unhappy. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, oh, okay, well, like, let's just go to both. And so like, I went to, and this actually like blew the mind of my friend who'd like never even kind of conceived that you could do both. Um, and so this is, this is an example of like the, yeah, like kind of looking at the, the underlying like assumptions of like what's possible. Uh, like if you just like brainstorm for like a, you know, a few moments, then often you can kind of generate stuff that like everyone is happy with including both halves of Luli. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um can you tell me about another like sort of stock example of a situation that might come up with a child in that situation even if it's not a real one from your actual life yeah the the, the typical like stock stock example is like one person wants like one fast food and one wants another mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. there's uh, commonly problems of um like parent needs to go and do something, uh, can't leave the child at home, child doesn't really want to go, what do you do in that situation? Um, and so, uh, like, there's there's always just, like, a dozen different things that, that could happen, like, like you could um, bring your Nintendo Switch in the car, or you could, um, like, call up a friend and say, like, hey, could you just, like, you, you know, and drop the child off there? Um, uh, you could, I mean, like, yeah, you could just kind of, like, generate a bunch of these, and like, I think what often happens in the kind of the conventional parenting is that you just kind of assume that it's this sort of uh, this insoluble, like, like, there's just going to be a fight and like, we have to like learn to compromise and like, okay, like, you know, you, like, come with me this time and then we'll get ice cream after and it's not really a satisfying thing and like, no one really get, gets what they want because they, they still have this conflict. Um, but like, like, if you even just suggested like, hey, we could get ice cream before so that while while we're going on this trip, then then we can have instead of like making it this sort of like oh I'll, I'll pay you back for this this harm that i've caused you mm -hmm. what do you see happening when you look at the conflicts of other people that aren't as steeped in this way of doing things uh there's a kind of a pessimism and a I think there's a fear of being hurt a lot of the time, like a fear that like if I don't do this coercive thing, then uh, I'm going to get hurt or like or I won't be able to have this thing that's important for my like feelings of happiness and safety and so on. Um, hmm. Can you tell me a bit more about critical rationalism and what it is? And that's the name for the philosophy of Karl Popper, is that right? Yes, yep, yep, yep. Can you tell me more about yeah. that? So um, it's like, I would say one of the, the biggest deviations um, from it to like a like classical sort of conventional epistemology is that um, in critical rationalism, all knowledge is guesswork, like it's all conjectural. And uh, so, you know, much like, as I was saying, like it's not that there's this authority that sort of passes down this thing, um, uh, it's, like, like none of our knowledge is stable. Like none of it is like, we haven't found like the ultimate truth of any, anything. And um, so, uh, and, and then it has like, and, and so yeah, it has details like um, that, uh, that it's created by like, you know, addressing your own problems, that it's like trial and error. Um, it's also uh, not um, like probabilistic or weighted. Uh, so like in Bayesian epistemology, then you have like probabilities for your belief being true. And uh, and under the Popperian framework, that doesn't make sense because like, so e either the idea is true or not, you are fallible in any case. And uh, and so what you have is sort of your, your best guess given the problem. And instead of like trying to weigh up all of these different ideas, um, you... Uh, you criticize them, which is why it's called critical rationalism. And the one that is uh, sort of has best survived criticism and like helps the most and is the, the best explanation is the one that's left standing. And so you don't need to do this weighing up because like this is already our, our, our best idea. Hmm. Uh, did I remember correctly that you mentioned that in your teenage years you became interested in philosophy and epistemology and so on? Um, it makes sense to me, like sort of steeped in the background that you grew up in, that you would become interested in philosophy and epistemology and, you know, kind of the, the uh, intellectual ideological background of the philosophy that sort of formed your education. But I'd be curious to hear 
from you, like what your memory is of that time and why you became interested in philosophy and epistemology and so on? Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't like, when, when I was a kid, I wasn't like, uh, I don't remember being interested in like, you know, I was more interested in video games um, up to a certain point. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, so one of the things that happened was, um, one of the things that happened was that in these, uh, the home educated camp that I mentioned, um, they, they, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to have this yearly thing called Hess Fest, which was home educated seaside festival. And it was like, everyone was camping and it was next to the seaside and it was so nice. And we'd, uh, and so we'd have these like long conversations that kind of like turned into these sort of philosophical uh, conversations. Like, you know, we were in, a, in our tents and we were just kind of having these conversations into the night and stuff. And so like, I think that was uh, like one of the things that first started like, oh, you, you know, like the ideas are interesting. Um, but another one was sort of, uh, oh, when, so I, I mentioned when I was 16, I, I uh, went to try out school. So I was um, uh, in, in the UK, uh, at 16 you do a levels and a, like basically you do like four subjects and you choose which subject and one of my subjects was philosophy and so i was talking to like the other you know kids in the in the philosophy uh thing and um and i found and like i already kind of yeah i guess i already knew some stuff about epistemology but like the thing that kind of got me like kind of sucked into it is that i found that that there were all of these things that just like seemed like wrong ideas to me uh like i i remember like having a conversation about uh like uh i think i was like i was just making some claim and uh and the other guy said um well what's the foundation for your belief i'm like no that's foundationalism and then i was like oh this is like and and so it kind of got to be this sort of fun thing to like learn about the the philosophies that like other people kind of had and then like kind of go and, and see like what the like the the popular and criticisms of them are and like then kind of like do this sort of like back and forth debating thing hmm. did you ever have like a uh like i've run across the idea that sort of in your teenage years you have some kind of like rebellion or revolt against authority or something like that and that that's a common theme did you ever have anything like that uh no i think that was already baked in like mm -hmm. uh i don't think i ever took authority seriously uh -huh. Uh -huh. fascinating fascinating uh, yeah because i think part I, like of maybe later in life like like because uh um so for a while i got into um ayn rand objectivism and like although in certain ways that's explicitly anti-authority um authority uh i think there's there were sort of subtle things about like the way that like like basically like ayn rand is a very sort of judgmental uh like character and like a lot of the the, the philosophy kind of has like bits of that um, so like, uh, maybe you could say like at, at some point I was like, oh, I was getting like, but I don't know. I don't think that really counts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really interesting. It, um, uh, it seems quite common that people have these rebellious stages, but it, it's not, uh, obvious to me that it would be like intrinsic an intrinsic stage of growth or something like that. And so you're you seem to be an interesting sort of counterexample to the idea it's like intrinsic of growing up or something like that I think it, I think it's quite common in like I, I can think of other like home educated people off the top of my head who are all kind of brought up with like complete disdain for authority mm. so yeah maybe it's not as as common I don't know yeah and the, but there's also like there's there's uh, reactions to authority and then there's reactions to one's parents and I think like like probably rebellions can can happen like uh, around one's parents like you know even, even if they tried the, hard, the hardest they could or whatever so like I can imagine that being like still a thing and then maybe maybe what happens uh, when people say oh yeah like kids have this rebellious thing like maybe a lot of it is kind of around that I don't know I'm just spitballing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is there anything uh, a lot of what we've talked about with respect to critical rationalism has been in sort of connection to this philosophy of taking children seriously. Is there anything else that's worth noting or sharing about critical rationalism on its own? Um, yeah, but it depends what kind of person <laughs> or like, mm -hmm. so in the context of this conversation, mm -hmm. oh, I guess one thing, uh, so, um, the reason that I'm, I'm sure that this is being asked is that there is like a, a, a group on Twitter of the, the crit rats. Mm. Um, and that is kind of its own, uh, like, like there are other reasons that that kind of community has sort of come up and come up at this time. And 
Um, so originally, like the critical rationalists were like fans of this like old philosopher called Karl Popper, um, and they were kind of more into like academic philosophy and and that sort of thing and and an analyzing whatever. Uh, more recently, um, the culture has been influenced by um, particularly by uh, this book called The Beginning of Infinity um, by David Deutsch and uh, and and he has an, a Twitter account and so that there are like some Twitter fans of his and, and the, these kind of comprise the, the crit rats and the thing that that community is kind of like like the reason that that's like a thing um, and attractive to people is that it's focused on human progress so like the book begins with the word progress and uh and and it's all about yeah like like the problems are soluble and the um like how do we make kind of more human progress and that we're always at the beginning of infinity like of like a growth and of progress and, and so on hmm. huh. um trying to think there's uh something in that that intrigues me that I want to see if I can articulate. Um, yeah, what what is the connection between David Deutsch and the more traditional academic side of things and Karl Popper and so on? Uh, he got interested in Karl Popper when uh, I think he was at university or something. And like, so he's a physicist, uh, he does quantum physics and other physics. And um, I think like he, he got interested in philosophy because he wanted, because he realized that in order to do good physics, like he had to like have some kind of sensible sort of philosophy. And, uh, and at first I think he um, uh, was into Russell and then uh, someone kind of put him on to Karl Popper and then, uh, and then he got like taken with it. And it was actually that, that caused him to, oh yeah, so there's a link between taking children seriously and David Deutsch, which is that uh, he realized that if you took Karl Popper seriously, then it implies these things about um, education. And so he was kind of interested in that. And um, and then uh, he and, and a couple of other co-founders uh, started up uh, taking children seriously as a kind of like um, applied thing to that. So, um, and, and another thing about that, so, uh, the the crit rats on Twitter and especially me uh, tend like I I am like very kind of um, psychology oriented and like I'm very interested in um, like parenting and relationships and like how to how to like human better and stuff and um, but Karl Popper like avoided psycho like talking about psycho like explicitly like was trying to because he saw the trap in like he he was interested in like what is the logic of science and, and of scientific discovery and like what what actually happens like what is actually possible uh to uh like how is it actually possible to have knowledge go from one to another and to be created and stuff and if if you start talking about psychology it's like very easy to get sort of subjective with it and so he just kind of like avoided talking about psychology as much as he could um and then um David Deutsch was interested in like he saw the the implications for things like raising children um, and so he started the ball rolling uh, for that and so and now I'm kind of like yeah and, and how, how do we apply it kind of more broadly to, to these things. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you first come across David Deutsch? Um, so because I, I kind of grew up in, in the sort of the TCS thing, um, I, uh, like he's kind of been, been around, um, yeah, for, for a while. The whole so, time. uh, yeah. when I was like, like very, uh, probably I was still like a toddler or something. <laughs> Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, yeah, I want to ask as well about, um, one of our shared interests is in, uh, these different like techniques or what you might call psychotechnologies or methods of uh, sort of working with one's own subjective experience and psychology. And um, can you just give me an overview of like uh, which, which methods you've tried and maybe how you got interested in that in the first place? Yeah, uh, we might have to do a whole thing on this because <laughs> this is a big topic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how did it start? I think, um, I think the first thing that I went to was uh, the Landmark Forum, um, and that was in 2016, and uh, and that was uh, like that was very cool in its own way. Um, let's see. I mean, should I just like rattle them off or like, uh, yeah? 
So uh, there's there's that. There's internal family systems. Um, there's um, uh, Alexander technique, but in particular the kind of the more mindfulness um, version of it, because uh, like a lot of people think Alexander technique is about posture, but actually I think it's about like you know awareness and mindfulness and that sort of thing. Um, let's see what else uh, there's. I have not done that much meditation. Uh, I've I've done like tiny bits of it, but it that like I've done like a lot of things kind of adjacent to meditation, but I haven't kind of quite got into that yet. So that's like probably going to be a good thing for me to try at some point. Um, uh, focusing. Uh, okay, so okay, so there, there was landmark. The the next like big thing for me was I went to the uh, Center for Applied Rationality workshop. Um, and they had a, a class on uh, Genling focusing, well, their version of it, which is a little bit different, but, but yeah, basically. Um, and uh, and that, that really helped kind of get in touch with um, like my feelings and my body and like, like the kind of the um, intuitive uh, like way of like thinking and being in the world. Um, so that was like a very big one. And then, um, and then let's see. Uh, belief reporting, um, which was this uh, leverage workshop. I, I think they, I don't know if they, they still do those, um, but that's still one that I use a lot. Uh, what else? I don't know, probably a lot more. Like I, I have a list of them somewhere. Mm. And which are the ones that you're sort of actively using the most? Uh, you said you still use belief reporting and what are the other ones that you yeah. use currently? Um, focusing, belief reporting, um, some Alexander Technique stuff. Uh, what else do I use regularly? Oh, recently I've been doing this um, course called, uh, I, I think I'm like uh, like a quarter of the way through this course or something uh, called VIEW. Mm -hmm. um, and this was made by uh, Joe Hudson and it's a very, um, how do I describe it? It's like how to be like really present in conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so VIEW stands for um, wonder, um, uh, what's the second one? Uh, impartiality, empathy, and vulnerability. Switch those mm -hmm. double anyway. Um, yeah. So uh, and and like basically, it's so so so. Um, it's like how to be uh, vulnerable, and and by vulnerable, it means something like being able to say the scary thing um, in in the conversation. Um, and then impartial, as in like you don't have an agenda for someone, and then um, you're like you're full of wonder, like it, a bit like curiosity, but in this kind of a bit more like open, because curiosity can be a bit more sort of like narrowed. Um, and then also like empathetic, like you know, feeling the other person's feelings and. The, and so like basically it's this state of mind and if you can access that state of mind it's this like really kind of nice thing like this really kind of engaging thing um so that's that's a a, a new one that i've been um dipping into hmm. uh, which of these methods do you tend to use when like when do you reach for say focusing versus i don't know alexander technique or internal family systems or something like that um I think usually I use them kind of in a flurry altogether. Uh, I, it's sort of, let me see. I think it kind of depends on the type of problem. Like if it's something where um, I've already identified in the past um, parts that are kind of strongly associated, then I might check in with them. Um, if it's something that is sort of unclear and I don't really kind of know like like what's going on, then I might try a bit of focusing or like belief reporting to see like what's like you know what I actually think about this. Yeah, so it kind of it very much depends on on the type of thing. Uh, I don't think he'd mind me sharing that uh, Michael Ashcroft mentioned to me in passing that he thought that uh, from what he could tell, it seemed like your education and uh, upbringing and uh, sort of background in critical rationalism made it easier for you to learn Alexander technique. Uh, would you agree with that? And can you speak to like what that was and why that might have been the case? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it's it's that, so like, first of all, um, in, in like, it, it was completely taken for granted that uh, force is not the way to go. And that like even forcing yourself is sort of, is, is not really the way to go. And, uh, and so non-doing in, in um, Alexander Technique is basically like the kind of the, the purest form of, of this like non-forcing sort of thing. 
Um, and so like, I was already, I think like basically I was already intellectually on board. Um, and then like in my own, like uh, whatever reason, like I, I'm not a perfect person that I did like, you know, like have a kind of a work ethic in, in certain ways that were like not entirely good. Um, and so uh, and so it's like, oh, this is what that idea was trying to get at. Like, like basically like the kind of the Popperian and the taking children seriously sort of framework kind of implies it like it, it's kind of like yeah like don't like like because basically if you're trying to force yourself to do something um you are uh it, it is uh, as we'd say like a, an irrational way of solving that conflict like instead of listening to that part that doesn't want to do it you're just saying like no like you don't count um and that that is just dogmatism and so uh so alexander technique is sort of like internal non-dogmatism <laughs> Um, and so like, and it, so it fits like really well with this, with the whole uh, framework. So I think that's probably the reason. Hmm. Hmm. And what, what is your experience of doing Alexander Technique been like? Um, I'm still very new at it, I would say. Um, like, even though I've known it for a while, it's, it's all been like, I haven't been able to go to any in-person classes yet uh, because of COVID. Um, but yeah, like what my experience? Um, so I actually first uh, started learning it just by reading Michael Ashcroft's uh, threads. Like he has like a bunch of threads and then some example exercises. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do these. Um, uh, shout out to ri rival voices who got me to, <laughs> to, to go through this. And, um, and so I did the, so there's this uh, non-doing exercise where you, you lie down on the floor and the thing is just like uh, notice any doing and then like release it, like, like just non-do. Um, and, and it was like a, this kind of like amazing experience. Like I kind of like had this kind of first of all, like deep relaxation and then I got kind of energy and then I found myself non doing, like getting up and kind of moving around and like really enjoying that. And I think like one of the reasons that it was so impactful for me is that like, I was always this kind of like nerdy geeky kid and like shy kid and whatever. And I always felt, um, like a little bit kind of awkward like in, in so certain social situations um like you know it was okay if, if I was interacting based on shared interests but like I always kind of had that like that thing where I was like I want to be this like charismatic and like this kind of uh like feeling free and like feeling you know in in myself and whatever but like I, I kind of didn't have that for whatever reason and I found that um Alexander technique like was the key to that thing that I'd always been seeking the, the the kind of yeah the like the expandedness and the the sort of the the freeness and 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 all that so um so it, yeah it's just immediately obvious that this was sort of the thing for me and then also um on on the kind of the intellectual level uh I think like Alexander technique is not just expanded awareness in space but also expanded awareness like in idea space and so like you know when when we're doing and when we're kind of like uh you know trying to get things done and stuff we're actually cutting off different options and different ideas and different connections that you could make and like the the, the thing that i'm interested in is like how do you like learn and grow knowledge and like discover things that have never been discovered before and like go anywhere that you want to in your mind and have this kind of very free sort of thing and so like it seems like also the answer to that so it's like this double whammy of of very good mm -hmm. beautiful uh would you mind speaking as well to your experience of doing internal family systems yeah what can i say about that um I actually, so I noticed that, uh, so I, I'd heard of IFS for a while because it was sort of in, in the waters around like um, CFAR and Twitter and stuff. And, um, and so I kind, and I kind of knew the basic idea that the mind was divided up into parts and then something. And so uh, there was a moment where I, I had a problem and uh, like, I think there was, it was like a, a weird social dynamic or something. And I noticed me responding in a weird way or like defensive. And I'm like, huh, what, you know, what, what's going on there? Um, and and then I kind of did like a basically like a journaling um, and like I noticed like, ah, I have one part of me that that wants this thing, but another part that doesn't want that part to do that thing. And is actually saying no part go away. And I'm like, huh, that's not very nice. Also, that's interesting. Um, and uh, and then I think even I, I found like a, a third part at that time. Um, and and like they had like a, there was a kind of a clear dynamic between them. And I'm like this this dynamic seems really specific. I wonder if IFS has something to say about this. So so I 
you know look up the, the IFS thing and find like it's exactly what it, what IFS would would have predicted. Like it had like the you know the manager and the firefighter and the exile and and I was like, oh, that's that was okay, cool. This seems very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh. How do you think about these different uh, methods relating to each other in your mind? Like uh, you said that when you use them, you kind of just tend to blend them together and maybe go on kind of intuition, but is there any sort of reflections that you have about how they fit together, or how you think of them? Yeah, like, so I'll do things like, I'll use, um, I'll use, like, so I have IFS kind of in the back of my mind, kind of looking out for these different parts and the, like, and kind of having guesses about like what kind of role those different parts might be taking. And then uh, in order to actually kind of hear what they're saying, often I'll use uh, focusing and sometimes belief reporting to kind of like, like, okay, you know, that, that I can feel like that that part is dissatisfied with something, what's actually going on there. And then I'll like consult the felt sense and kind of do a bit of like the resonating and, and all of that. Um, then, yeah, what else? Uh, and then, um, and yeah, and then it depends on the situation. So if I'm uh, doing like public speaking, then Alexander technique is sort of more um, relevant. Um, if I'm, or like recording a YouTube video um, uh, for introspection, yeah, that kind of thing. Can you tell me about your interest and history with art? Yeah. Um, so immediately, like when you said history with art, I um, so I so like basically I've been interested in art for from a very young age, um, and uh, the 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 first memory I have of actually like doing art was that I was I was sat at this like you know small child's desk. And, uh, and and I have and I, I think it's markers or something. Um, I, I think it might be might have been something like there was like this Tony the Tiger like Frosties uh, Frosted Flakes in America. Um, uh, like I think that it came with like some pens or so. I don't. I remember that, that there being that box there. And so like I was drawing on on the paper and I was like this is fun. And then I look over to the wall and I was like that is mighty mighty inviting. And so I start drawing on the wall. Um, and it's like the most fun thing ever. Um, and then uh, and then basically like after after a couple of years that wall has now been like covered in like drawings from like absolutely everyone who goes through the house I think it's been painted over now which is sad um, but yeah like that was a uh, and that was that was my room at, at the time and so it was this sort of like I don't know I, I have really fond memories of that uh, so it, that's how it started then I was a teenager and drew anime and then I like got into realism and other stuff it strikes me that that's like the perfect example of the kind of thing that like in a traditional parenting philosophy would be like no you can't draw on the walls those are sacred and hallowed in their bland wallpaper nature and then, uh yeah, yeah. That, that would be I, so I thought like this is this is what it was destined for I feel <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh and I assume it your parents just like let way. you do that I think they, they joined yeah yeah they joined <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah oh uh, that's fascinating uh definitely a better way to do it I love it um huh yeah. Um, what is your, so I, I know that you have like currently like multiple sort of art facing social media accounts on like Twitter and DeviantArt and stuff like that. Like what are your current interests with art and what, it, what, what currently are you exploring with art? I've, one of the reasons that I'm so into art and like this, this, I feel like this sounds like a, uh, a kind of a post hoc ra rationalization, but I feel like it's really true of art. Art is like really epistemological. It's like, it's really connected to, so like in order to do good art, you have to understand like perspective maps and like uh, the physics of, of light and, uh, and like muscles and like bones and uh, like, and all of these different sorts of things and design. And like, you have to like wear a lot of different hats. And so it's it's kind of a way to be endlessly curious about the world. Like, like because I'm interested in art, like I can just like look at stuff and like it's interesting and I'm like learning about it. I'm thinking like, how would I draw that? And like, how is the light working? And like, you know, and, and so you can like get better at art just by like looking at stuff. And that is just like such a wonderful feeling to sort of ne never be bored. Um, so that, that's kind of like a general thing. Oh, and, and then also like learning art. Um, I love it because 
when like basically that kind of feedback so you can you can draw something and you can see like the mistakes you've made like just you can see them right there on the page and then you do another drawing and you can see your knowledge like change from one page to the other at at a glance and and i so i love that about it um yeah recently uh so i've, I've been on a rather long uh, art hiatus I've, I've only recently like just gotten back into it um i i'm also interested because um it's a it's a place where uh, I can learn how to learn faster um, and like there are uh, techniques in art that like help you get to like a realistic sort of uh, thing like way way faster than like the normal techniques that are taught and so I'm interested in like huh why why doesn't everyone use these and like how come there are different like art communities that have like different uh, like techniques and, and stuff like that um so yeah I'm, I'm really like theory oriented with art like I actually draw fairly infrequently but I do read a lot um and like look at a lot of tutorials and think about it a lot do you have any goals with your art explorations no, and, and I, hope, I hope I shall never have them okay so I thought that was like a uh I feel like it's it's been interesting with art because it's like the one of the fields that I feel like I've most like non did non -do, non doing appliedness um, and uh, and so like it's yeah like so I have like certain problems that I'm interested in like I have certain like things like ah yes I would like to learn how to draw with the site size method uh, I'd like to like learn how to draw like realistic like you know I'd love to do like a portrait of a friend or, or something like that but it's it's all been um, like very much driven by the fun of the moment and like what I'm interested in and curious about like I want to learn all of the arts like I want to just learn all of it uh, I don't know if I ever will but I will learn like a lot of it I think and um and so yeah like I have I have a list in my head of like the stuff that I haven't learned that much yet that I would like to learn more of um and like I could have like like daydreams of like yes I would like to uh, be like uh, I, this is no longer a thing but like I, I remember thinking like yeah I like of course I want to like learn how to be like better than like you know Leonardo da Vinci and like whatever like uh, and of course that's possible, um, but it's not like a goal it's just like huh that's a possible thing and it's fun to like learn to be better and like that's a thing that might happen but like I think as soon as as soon as you'd start putting goals on it then I would I'd work like. I, like okay this, this maybe kind of comes down to I'm, I'm fairly anti-goals in general like I, I think the better thing is to have problems that you're interested in and then like end results kind of emerge from following those um, but like I'd want I want it to be like interesting as much as possible in the moment um, yeah hmm. um, can you say more about that generally about the philosophy towards goals like uh, what is it about goals that doesn't work or that you don't like or would criticize yeah the i mean so partly it depends uh what what you mean when you say goal so i, mm -hmm. I have this ongoing um debate with malcolm ocean mm. uh where where he's like more like no, no no that that's just like coercive goals or something um mm. so you know maybe maybe you could feel fiddle with the definition but um uh the thing i don't like about goals so part of it is the trying to predict the future state of knowledge. Mm. So you're you're like you, you think like this will be a good result, um, but like the more you have like this fixed result that you're trying to get to, then the less you can sort of discover newer, better results like along the way. Um, and then also like if there's any creativity involved in getting to that result. Like if it, if it's just like a, a like a to do list thing like where you know that if you do this then you will get that then you know fine like that's that's just but if if there's any opportunity for like oh I need to create a new thing or like or something like that then I don't goals like become like like I don't know if meaningless or coercive like one or the other um, because like you want to kind of see where the creativity actually takes you. Hmm. Is so there, my philosophy is problems rather than goals. Uh huh. Uh huh. Is there a time where you held a goal yourself and that didn't go well, or something like that? Like where you're in your own experience, goals sort of constrained you in the way that you're describing. Um. Yeah. I mean, I feel like this kind of happened. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a time when um, I think I was I was in my early twenties and I was um, I was making a, an iPhone app uh, with a friend, 
and I like it kind of like because I was working with someone else and there was kind of like like we like actually needed to like release it for all of our work to like pay off and stuff um and and there was a kind of um a way that I was approaching that that was very like I have to do this and if I don't do this that would be bad and so like this is the thing that I have to do and so um yeah so I, I feel like that was a a kind of an, an example of, of one of these and what, what happened there with that app, like when you were holding that attitude? Um, I, at first, like, uh, so at first with, with the idea is like, oh, this is really fun. I'm going to learn like iPhone app design. And then it like, as, as the project kind of like got drawn out and stuff, um, it got increasingly sort of stressful to work on it. Um, it like I, I was sort of procrastinating a lot I was sort of like avoiding it and it was just kind of it like it became this sort of like big thing that I, I, I didn't want to do um, at, at the time. Hmm. Am I right in thinking that all of this uh, like this you know general gestalt of critical rationalism and taking children seriously relates to uh, this sort of meme of like non-coercive productivity? Yes, yes, yeah. I, uh, I I was so happy to discover that that's a thing. And like, because I remember, like, uh, for most of my life, um, TCS was the only place that I, I heard even use the word coercion in the kind of internal sense instead of like just one person coercing, uh, coercing another. Uh, and then I discover on Twitter that there's like a whole bunch of people who like have the same kind of conception of coercion. Um, so, yes. What are you, can you, uh, assuming that I had never heard of non-coercive productivity, which is, you know, counterfactual, but uh, could you just describe what that is and how you understand it? Yeah, I, I imagine that different people will understand it in a slightly different way. Uh, my understanding is that um, we kind of think that we have to, we have to do stuff in the world. And, and sometimes we have to do stuff that we don't like doing. And we, you know, we have to go to work, we have to, uh, like, finish projects and um, all of this sort of thing and uh, and then it turns out that all of this is baloney and actually um, if you follow your own fun your own interests uh, then you end up doing like more stuff or better stuff or at least like you have a better time with life um, and it's actually fine like you know the you, you don't uh, then like suffer and, and have like uh like lose your job necessarily or whatever like you know some people quit their job and do something that they like more but it's sort of uh it is not necessary like suffering is not inevitable suffering like you don't need to kind of be like oh well I guess this is a part of my life where I have to suffer uh like there, there are other ways of doing it that can avoid that hmm. what would you tell someone who's interested in being less coercive to themselves and others, but maybe it doesn't have this background or this is a totally new idea for, like what would you tell them to help them get started? Um, if I had to give them three letters, I would say IFS. <laughs> um, uh, if I said more, um, yeah, so I, I guess I would start asking them like why why they think that they need to be uh, coercive, like 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 getting to kind of grips of like what what is their current kind of views, um, and like you know psychological structure and stuff, um, and uh, yeah, and like like ideas like um, that for any problem that you have where you think that you need to do coercion there's going to be some other solution like there's going to be like 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 how about we you know sit for five minutes and think of like let's brainstorm like a list of things um that you could do instead of this thing that you don't want to do that would have like the same like benefits that you want i can imagine such a person saying something like well it makes sense that one person could be coercive to another person that like a parent to a child as we've been talking about or you know, uh, like a police officer to a citizen of a government or something like that. But uh, what does it even mean to be coercive to yourself? What would you say to a person that had that question? Yeah, um, it, it's when you've got like a, an internal conflict. Um, so yeah, in, in IFS, we, we talk about like there are different parts of you that want different things or that um, 
like so uh, quite often there are conflicts between your explicit uh, view of what to do like yes I should do this and this is the rational thing to do and then your feelings like yeah but I really don't want to do it um, or sometimes like you you're like oh I super want to do this thing um, but I think it's a bad idea so I guess I won't eat that cake um, and and all of these are just kind of conflicts and so the coercion is when one of those parts has priority just like for you know for some reason like arbitrarily basically because uh, I think all, all authority in this way is is uh, arbitrary um, so I, I, whichever is stronger or something it comes mm -hmm. down to that might makes the right thing hmm. what do you think it is about IFS that helps you sort of unwind that internal coercion um, first, it helps you notice that it's uh, happening. So I, I think a lot of people just kind of like they feel bad, but they're not kind of aware that like internal conflict is a thing. Um, then it allows you to find out what those parts actually like want and think. And quite often in this situation, like the reason, so wh whenever you have a conflict, there is a uh, a lack of knowledge in some way so like um like one or both of the parties is wrong uh usually both uh quite like sometimes one of them uh, some, sometimes one of them doesn't have the information that the other one has and um and so in ifs uh you can do this sort of all internally like basically you've got one part of your mind that isn't really like talking to another part and so they uh yeah, you, you can kind of pull out like more of the the ideas and have them kind of talk to each other so that you can like try and get a solution. It's really interesting to me at this point in the conversation how these different fields or methods have a number of overlapping like assumptions or results or like methods or things like that, like, um, you know, like critical rationalism is like a philosophy or an epistemology and then there's like a pedagogy built on that and then you know uh, ifs is like a psychotherapeutic technology and like non-coercive productivity that's you know the people that i see talking about that are uh you know maybe interested in knowledge work and uh doing better at their jobs and very practical things and um it's just interesting to me that there's sort of such a big overlap in uh, the kind of findings or methods or approaches that these seemingly mm. disparate uh, fields take. Yeah, I guess I guess it's like truth converges, and so like when we're all trying to find like how to do things better, then then we get overlapping results. Mm. Fascinating. Um, now, recently, you and I did a call recently, and it was it was so funny. It was a really funny moment. You you asked me. We were just getting to know each other, and we you asked me, "What do you?" value and care about <laughs> and i would love for you to answer the same the same question what do you value and care about a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about actually mm -hmm. um like the like the thing that i've always kind of explicitly thought like yes this is the thing i care about is the growth of knowledge and progress and like i i i don't like the idea of running into problems that then like either destroy us or get us stuck in stasis for eternity and uh and so yeah like this is this is why i'm interested in in epistemology it's that like you know problems will come up and and i and i want to like like create like not just like solutions to those but also like new things like i want like i still want a flying car uh, i can't drive but i'm i'm sure that at some point like we i won't even need to be able to <laughs> mm. um and uh yeah like like so so that's one thing and then and then i think more like specifically in terms of my my interests and my interest in sort of psychology and and everything i i see I see people like uh, suffering and, um, and I, I suffer and uh, people getting stuck and I get stuck and I'm really interested in like how, how do we be more kind of like unleashed humans in, in the world um, and like like I feel because like we all have the potential like to to create great things and to like be very vibrant and like have the vibrancy that we used to have as kids like we could all do that 
Uh, so how how do we make that actually happen? Because like I think we've discovered loads of things about how to do that. Like there's there's things in like you know meditation and all of these different like psychotechnologies and stuff. And they're they're quite like they're still quite niche. And it's sort of a thing that I would have thought that like everyone would be interested in at least to some extent. Uh, like having a nice life and stuff. So that seems good to me. Let's do that thing. So you're interested in uh, like progress generally, and then also like the reduction of suffering. You'd say. Yeah, uh, elimination if possible. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes, great. Uh, what you, you talked earlier about um, framing things in terms of problems, both one's own interests and then also, you know, as opposed to goals. And I'm curious, that makes me curious what your current problems or open questions are that you have. Um, it's interesting that so so you phrased my my last thing um, as uh, reduction of or yeah reduction of suffering and then like progress. Um, I so I think these are kind of the same thing. Like I think basically like suffering is uh, when paths to progress get blocked. Um, and so one of the questions that I have is what is the like very specific internal mechanism by which this happens like what is actually happening in a mind that causes it to get stuck because it, it seems like a sort of a strange thing uh, for a mind to do like how does it actually do that like uh is it is it that it um uh gets like blocked off from certain ideas and then how does that happen uh is it like um, is it like constantly sort of just diverted to something else? Is it like focusing on one thing all the time? But then how do you even like, because if we're like kind of creative, like we're we're creating things all the time, like we're, we're thinking all the time, like that's kind of, uh, then how do we get kind of caught in this loop where we go over the same thing over and over again? Like what, what's what's causing that loop? Uh, so, so uh, and I have some ideas about that involving um, meta discussion and coercion and uh, all of this stuff. Tell me about that. Um, so uh, this, this is a, uh, a, a very conjectural thing that I have not fleshed out, but it is kind of currently my, my pet theory. Um, so meta discussion is a discussion about the discussion or its participants. And so, um, so quite often like negative self-talk is like a good example of meta discussion. And, and I think what happens like, so uh, you, you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think like the only way to get a loop is for at some point in this, th there to be a step that refers back to itself. And so I think that that must mean that like meta is connected to it. And so like, basically what I think happens is when we are getting stuck, um, you have this um, a thought of, of something like, um, oh, but like, you know, but I'm not good enough or like, I can't do it or, or something or like, or, oh, that, that, that there's some kind of um, meta th or like, oh, that's impossible or whatever. It's like a, a meta commentary on like the object level thing. And then that like makes the loop kind of uh, go, go around again. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, um one of the teachings from my teacher, Soryu, of like, he would talk about, uh, and th this is the way that he would articulate uh, a much older teaching. It wasn't unique to him, but uh, it's it's sort of where I came across it of, he would talk about, um, well, to take a step back, sometimes people will parody um, meditators or Buddhists or something like that. It's like being against thinking, like, oh, thinking is bad. Or similarly, maybe more broadly against like spiritual people of like, oh, self is bad, ego is bad or something like that. And um, like in my experience, it's not quite either of those things. It's not that thinking is bad or that self is bad, but then it's like, well, why, why would that come up even as a parody as the thing that people would say about meditators or Buddhists or spiritual people or something like that? And the way he would talk about it is, oh, it's the, fu the fundamental problem is attachment to concept of self. So it's three parts. There's self, concept, and attachment. So it's not just the thinking or just the selfing that's the problem, but it's the attachment to the concept of self. And, uh, you know, I would notice that in my own experience of like, um, you know, for a time in my meditation practice, I was trying to learn how to, how to stop thinking, how to cut off thinking. And it would be much harder to cut off a thought of like, oh, I'm a good person or, oh, I'm a bad person or even like uh, I want to do this or something as opposed to a thought like it's raining outside. Like if I had the thought it's raining outside, I could cut that off. No problem, because that's not 
a thought about self, but it's it just the shape of a concept about self is much easier to get attached to or conversely, like harder to let go of. Yeah, this is this is really interesting because it um, it fits in with uh, an, a, a thought that I had about um, meditation and what's happening. I was I was uh, listening to a Sam Harris podcast, um, and uh, he was talking about th this thing of like kind of like the the non thinking and that that that's kind of the, the state that you want to get to. And but the, but the way that it was it, that he was describing like like he was describing like you know the the kinds of thoughts that that go around, like basically the negative self talk. And uh, and I was thinking, huh, that's and, and, and then calling this the self, like calling this the and I was thinking, no, that's like that's that's the almost opposite of what I would think of as, as a self. So like the um, I think like what happens in those situations is that instead of like being in flow and thinking about the content and like if you're rock climbing, like, you know, kind of being just like being the rock climbing and um, and like doing this sort of inexplicit sort of processing there um, or like working on on a problem and, and sort of like then it kind of comes to you or whatever, like being in flow, uh, you are like commenting on it and you're you're saying ah like this is you should be doing this better and you should whatever and all of this stuff is is not like actually the kind of like what what like humans i think fundamentally are like that's just like a kind of a layer on top um and so yeah like like to me and 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 this this isn't like the thinking this is the thing that's preventing you from thinking like this thing is the thing like being in the flow so so it's kind of like a, a funny kind of like word word thing where where thinking has come to me like only the kind of explicit thinking and then also with connotations of this sort of like less nice more forcey like it's so embedded in the culture that that force and and coercion and like making yourself do things that that even thinking which is the best thing in the world is is now like uh, associated with like coercion and force and like you know talking like mean thoughts to yourself mm -hmm. fascinating can, can you say more what you mean by uh like the way you're describing it you're pointing to an activity that thinking is that's not the same as self-talk or or anything like that like yeah. how do you understand what thinking is so I, I think yeah thinking is um the like I, I would say like any kind of like mental processes basically and so um a lot of those are sort of inexplicit subconscious and like I think that all of those are thinking but just not with the like weird layer thing because like you don't actually need the weird layer thing you can just kind of be in the moment what what is meant by the adjective mental there um ooh, good question uh like, like mind stuff uh how do i say this without using synonyms um so, I mean, I think that all uh, human level thought, yeah, so may maybe I mean like human level thought. So I, I think that all human level thought um, consists of doing this uh, problem solving thing. Um, like uh, even even if it's sort of um, subconscious and stuff and like, and it's kind of creating conjecture, like I, I think it's all the conjecture and criticism thing that the critical rationalism um, outlines. And, um, but it doesn't have to be this sort of conscious thing that most people think of as thinking. Um, can you say more about uh, what criticism and conjecture are from a critical rationalist perspective? Yeah, uh, conjecture is just like a fancy word for guess um, or like creating ideas or creating like, you know, models or, or whatever um, and uh, or, or connecting. Um, and then criticism is um, finding problems, uh, finding contradictions, um, like seeing which things like kind of whittling, like, like we can create like loads of ideas. A lot of them won't be very good, won't be helpful for our problem. Uh, and so criticism is the way of whittling those down. I see, I see. So you take a guess and then you sort of uh, poke holes at the guess and see what sticks. Yeah, if if you um, especially if you have more than one guess uh, to to try and address the same problem, like if you've only got one guess, then uh, the thing to do is to guess more stuff mm -hmm. um, because like otherwise it's your best guess, and like having no guess is, is worse than having a guess a, a lot of the time. Um, so yeah. So you make many guesses and then you sort of poke holes at them, see what sticks, and then that uh, forms a better theory or understanding of what's happening in a given aspect of experience. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's basically like uh, like evolution. It's it's a sort of like you've got the random variation and then you've got the selection and it's, it's mm. exactly the same. Hmm. And so the claim there is that that's like what thought is, is guessing yes. and 
yes. poking holes yeah. at things as it were yeah or, or human level thought i don't know about like that there's like uh probably stuff that's like regulating like heartbeat and stuff that uh mm -hmm. may not be that mm -hmm. um also uh i like maybe you could think about i don't know like can you think i I was, I was thinking, like, can you think about things that you, w that doesn't involve problems? And I think the answer is no. I think that's just stuff that maybe, like, me like I don't know, like, maybe bringing up memories or something. Hmm. This makes me curious because um, one way that I have... How to put this? One simplistic way that you could limit thought subjectively would be like mental talk phrases that you hear in your head and then also images that you might have and then I think there's also uh, sort of a somatic embodied equivalent of that that's like feeling mm. things being thought that doesn't necessarily bubble up into talk or images and uh, you know I think that's probably some of what you've explored through like focusing and maybe some of those other methods. And I'd be curious to hear if, if you have experienced that kind of thinking and how that sort of somatic embodied thinking would fit into this model. Yeah, so I think that all of that is, um, I mean, it's all happening uh, in, in the brain. Um, like, yes, there is a body, but like at the end of the day, it's like what what the, the, the signals are that kind of like, like they can be faked, right? Like, like the processing technically isn't happening in the body. As far as I know, tell me if I'm wrong about this, like physically, but I think like it, it's it's more about the signals that go up to the brain and then are processed and it's sort of associated with the body. Like the mm. like there's nerve endings and it goes up and then and then it's like ah and, and that's a thing. Is that well I'm coming at it from a very like phenomenological experience yeah. and like uh yeah, I just I mean just from that side of it, like I will experience having a thought in my stomach or in my chest or you yeah. know in my neck or something like that and so i don't know what it is on a sort of material or uh uh neuro neurological basis yeah. but it, I guess, it seems yeah, to be I guess located in the body yeah um it seems to be uh mm -hmm. it, yeah it's sort of like okay well it depends what like it probably doesn't even like this distinction probably doesn't matter too much like the um the reason I bring it up is that like, I kind of want to point to that um, even though there are like different sort of like uh, things like there's, there's the feelings and then there's the kind of the conscious thoughts and all of these have like a different, um, different qualia associated with them. Um, I think that it's more on a, like it's on a higher level that like, like, like close to the metal I think it's all this kind of conjecture and refutation thing mm -hmm. like I think it's all this like problem solving thing and then you've got like various different types of that uh that like help you think in different ways and like probably like I, I mean like another thing is that this is also kind of getting close to like what we know about like how uh, like consciousness and how like the the human computer works like uh, I could imagine that possibly um like feelings and stuff is related to how like memory is stored or something like that um, and so like, uh, so there could be sort of stuff that is, is something like that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure like how known that that is. Um, mm -hmm. But just in terms of like, like all of these, I guess like what I mean by mental content is like there is something there that uh, is like a, a model or an idea or corresponding to something and it can be updated. Like it can be changed. It can like better correspond to the world or better correspond to like what you like or, or whatever. And so, yeah, so so like that that's kind of what I mean by by mental content. Yeah, I think I'm going to be kind of watching my subjective mental content, both the talk and images, but also especially I think the feelings in my body and sort of be aware of whether or not they have this shape of conjecture and refutation and see if that's what they seem to be shaped like like even with these somatic thoughts like there is um, discernible content to it that I could sort of, uh, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, inspect and see like, oh, is this really shaped like conjecture and refutation or does it seem to have a different shape? Yeah, I wonder whether it's um, like, 
uh, like like at, at which levels it's sort of noticeably like that. So like when you're when you're like working on a science problem, then it feels like a lot more kind of obviously like that. And then when you're doing um, more kind of like focusing and stuff, then it, it feels like because it's a, a lot less explicit. I, I know actually focusing is like maybe a good example of like how you can do this with feelings. It's like, huh, is like, what is this feeling? Is it this? No, it's not quite this. So yeah, maybe that's a bad example. But I, like, hmm. I wonder like whether you can find that at all levels or whether there are some like levels of doing like something else with it. Uh, I, don't, I, would, I would guess you could find it all, all levels, but I don't know. Let me know how it goes. Did, did I understand you correctly just there to be saying that in your experience of focusing, it does have the shape of conjecture and refutation? Yeah. I mean, like the whole, the whole like resonant, like, like if we just look at the, what, what the steps are. So what's, what's, uh, it was like step, whatever it, it's, so, so you find the felt sense and then you, uh, and then you give it a handle. And so that, that giving it a handle, like that's always a process of like trying to find like a thing that fits it or, and then you're kind of checking it against it. And so that's, so you've got the, handle step which is the conjecture step and then you've got the resonate resonating step which is the criticism step and mm. yeah mm. that's really interesting yeah i think um just this model putting this model next to my own lived experiences is really it's a really interesting way to look at things so that's that's part of why i ask and and i guess actually part of what i'm reflecting on in the background some of the uh uh thinking that's happening in the background is like looking at my own lived experience of say one of these conversations or even this conversation now of like, um, I've done a lot of reflecting recently on like the process through which I ask questions in these conversations. And a lot of it, um, especially, well, you know, there's sort of a, a, a like a, um, how to put it, mental discursive process that happens before the interview where I'm like preparing a list of questions and I sort of order them. But then in the moment when I'm speaking with someone, um, and certainly in this conversation, I'll notice that I'm like drawn to something and curious about something. And that often happens before I'm able to clearly articulate what the question is or what the curiosity is. And, and sometimes actually most recently, like I've really been attuned to the way in which um, my ability to articulate it lags my self-understanding about what the curiosity is. So often I sort of like stumble over my words and like say things like not very fluidly in a sort of stumbling manner, even though I'm like clear, oh, this is my question. It may not come out clear yet in words or in a way that's quite as crisp as I might like it. Mm. Yeah, all of that is very relatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything that's related to any of the topics that we've talked about that you'd like to dive in more or say more about? I'm, I'm curious about like what got you uh, interested in like asking these questions and especially about the, the critical rationalism stuff, because like, I feel like in this conversation, we've, we've, we've made more connections to, to critical rationalism and, and like, we, we've kind of bridged like post rationalism and critical rationalism sort of more than I've, I've seen in, in uh, other conversations. And yeah, so like, uh, yeah, like what, what got you interested in like asking about critical rationalism and stuff? Mm -hmm. Can Before I answer that, can you say yeah. just for anyone listening what post-rationalism is and like why you would say that uh, what you just said that it's more yeah. that we've gotten deeper into it here? Uh, so yeah, post-rationalism, effectively it's... Um, disgruntled ex-rationalists mm -hmm. or it's uh people who were in sort of the the bayesian rationalist scene and then have realized oh uh there's there's more to life than than just mathematics um there's also feelings and there's like the human body and there's like um uh, all of these sort of psycho technologies and stuff so uh post-rationalism is effectively um yeah, people who are kind of, I, this is how, I think like different people define it sure. in different ways, but sure. I think it's, yeah, basically it's like the rationalist adjacent people who are interested in psychology and introspection and feeling and, um, and maybe also the more woo end of things. Right, right. That's part of why I ask as well, because um, I, I think it's fair to describe me as rationalist adjacent or even post adjacent, but I've never identified as a rationalist or uh, or even as a post-rationalist. I'm certainly interested in all of the things you just yeah. mentioned, but uh, it's not like yeah, I, my I own self-concept. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I also, I like, I was never, so I mean, I was always like a, a critical rationalist, which is kind of, it's actually closer to post-rationalist than, than the kind of the Bayesian rationalist. And so like, I was never quite that, uh, but like now one of my Twitter accounts is being accused of being a post-rationalist. And so like, and I think it's kind of a social circle anyway, so. And that's that's Meta Lily that's being accused of being post rationalist. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Which, uh, fair enough. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Uh, someone recently, it's funny that you use the verb accused because someone recently described my blog as being like a rationalist take on meditation and other topics, and I was like, I was like, ooh, I felt accused by that. <laughs> <laughs> like, ooh, yeah. maybe I need to change things up here. <laughs> uh, no, it's kind of a joke. Not really a joke. Maybe a joke. Um, yeah, so I will I will skip dancing around this question and actually answer it. Um, why am I interested? Well, one, I think I'm always interested in people and where people come from and uh, what their own background is. And, you know, just hearing you talk about your background, uh, it really occurred to me, well, one, how different it was from my own education and my own educational background and um, just how precious it is that you would be raised that way. And uh, certainly there were lovely and beautiful things about my own childhood, but, you know, I didn't, ha wasn't exposed to the environment that you were, and it was just quite different. So I wanted to hear more about that. And it seemed like this philosophy is really intrinsic to the way that you've grown up and the way that you've lived your life. And just, just if only from a personal perspective mm -hmm. of like wanting to get to know you better, both as a person and also someone that's like had a different background than I have. Um, which I guess is is coming to just a general curiosity about life and different ideas. And um, yeah, I think I'm also interested in, um, well, I'm interested in a lot of the same philosophical questions that you are and have been interested in them for some time, but haven't really known much about Karl Popper or critical rationalism, or like I haven't read David Deutsch's books or anything and don't know much about him. So um, like an interest in this, the overall related questions, but an ignorance about the uh, specific topics or schools of thought. And um, and then also I'd say, you know, I've been interested in productivity for some time and uh, certainly it seemed like at a certain point, uh, if someone even asked this question a while ago, if they were like, hey, like people started talking about non-coercive productivity, but like, where did that even come from? And uh, people mentioned a few different sources. And I remember uh, taking children seriously coming up at that point in time. And uh, so I guess I'm curious about that and how that's influenced productivity. And um, I, I think productivity is quite fascinating. I've been interested in it for such a long time. And uh, I realized that it can look kind of boring and dull to people, but it's like such an interesting topic to me. And um, on a lot of levels, just both like functionally that there are things that I want to get done, but also just in terms of what it shows about how people work and like what a life well lived is. And uh, so I've been interested in non-coercive productivity from that angle and just kind of curious historically about where these ideas come from and, uh, and, and also how to implement them. I think it's still sort of emerging what, what it actually looks like to act and learn, learn and play and try things in a non-coercive way. Like, I don't think that knowledge is well distributed, even just mm. for me, like, I don't think I fully have that. I think I have it to some extent, but um, not fully. And yeah, I think those are some of the reasons I was curious about those topics. Yeah, yeah, especially especially for adults. Like, I think the the children sort of naturally like you know then they're, they're naturally like you know making things and doing doing like and like creating a thing overnight, and it's like wow, you did all of that in one night. Um, and then somehow we yeah something happens and we lose that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it can that, be recovered. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of that Picasso quote of like all children are artists and then the problem is to remain an artist as you mm. grow and I recently tweeted about that but like transposing it to dancing uh because I've recently gotten into dancing as well myself after a long time of not being interested in it and and actually that's part of why I asked you about art as well because there's been just recently like a, a significant increase in interest in art on my part and I'm still not really sure like why I'm interested in art or um, where that's going and just have an intuition that it's like more meaningful than I've uh, 
allowed it to be in the past. And, and on the one hand, I don't really need there to be like an answer of like, oh, this is why I'm interested, but I am curious. Then there's something there that I don't understand yet. And to that extent, I'm sort of like curious about just why that is and what, what role art has. And uh, I'm just, and for the meantime, I'm just trusting it and allowing that and exploring it in different ways, but I'm curious to be exploring that more and more. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious, like what kind of um, answers you, you come to, like, do you have any, like what, what kind of guesses do you have about why it's interesting to you now? Um, one part is a general, I talked about this on uh, a recent episode with River the Wilderless on Twitter, but I think I've had a similar shift with stories of, um, you know, he, he made a joke and, and I should ask him to make this meme actually, but he made a joke about like a, a midwit meme for this of like, when you're a kid, like, oh, stories are incredible. And then when you're an adult, it's like, oh, stories are a waste of time and just a distraction. And then he was describing this sort of like final form that's similar where you do appreciate stories again, although he was adding nuance to like what exactly the final version is. And, um, you know, that it's, it's less of a naive uh, view on why stories and narratives and myths and so on are important. And I think I see something similar there with art where art is maybe a different method of exploring the same questions of stories and human meaning and significance and identity and so on. And it's a really striking one where images stay with you and they come back and to you again and again. And I think really good stories implant images in your mind and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think some of it has had to do as well with uh, being exposed to like what's called in, in meditation circles, like imaginal practice or uh, Robert Bay's like soul making Dharma of noticing that there are images and that those have a real impact on the way that we perceive ourselves or behave in the world. And that you can kind of use those intentionally to create meaning in your life. And so I'm sort of interested in that oh, and how cool. yeah yeah I, there's a couple of different um like introspection and then coaching practices that that have that like uh there's um there's something called uh clean coaching which um uses metaphor and imagery and stuff a lot and like basically like it's kind of like a um an introspection or like coaching session where you're exploring your metaphorical landscape and seeing like what wants to do what and like you know you is there like a piece of paper that wants to be cut by a thing and then like somehow at the end of all of that you're like yeah I know what I want to do with my life and, and that sort of thing so so that's very cool also focusing has it Mm -hmm. um one of the things that 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 uh what you said makes me think of is that this whole yeah like stories being important um and like the meaning and um this kind of gets at so like I was talking about like the kind of the explicit sort of like thinking sort of thing and then there's this sort of like uh, inexplicit sort of subconscious thing and um one of the things I've been interested in is sort of like how undervalued the inexplicit subconscious stuff is and how like all of like meaning and like not just kind of meaning as in like purpose of life but also meaning as in like what does this actually mean what does this correspond to like it, it's all kind of uh in in the the inexplicit stuff and and what i think stories are really good at is kind of getting at those like intuitions those kind of models and, and that sort of stuff so yeah i hadn't i hadn't thought about like art as, as, a, as something like that but that's cool Hmm. Yeah, it reminds me that, um, you yeah, know, I was talking earlier about like, that there you could just phenomenologically, and this is what I've done from a meditation perspective, but you could break up thinking in terms of like, image, talk and body, like emotional or subjective body sensation, as opposed to like heat or cold or something like that, which is more of a physical sensation. Um, and at least in my experience of it, like, mental talk is maybe you might say the most legible where it's like oh you know I am thinking about Luli and I wonder how Luli is doing today kind of thing uh and then somatic content is like the least legible where it's like oh there's this like thing around my stomach and I'm not sure what it means uh, but then conversely like it seems like the uh there's the most meaning or content or impact or importance in the body sensations and then the least in like I wonder how Luli is doing today like mental talk like that has some significance but it's like you know eight words of content whereas like the yeah. meaning in their body is incredibly 
meaningful if you can unfold it. And images, I think, are sort of in between that, where they're, they're like partly legible and then partly impactful, like kind of a, a mean between the two. What, what do you think uh, causes that? Like, I have a guess, but I want to hear what your, your guess is. Well, over my history in meditation practice, I really developed and was even instructed in sort of a kind of reverence for the body. And I think, um, and this goes back to our like little bit of a debate there earlier, but like, you know, whether it's in the brain or in the body and uh, at least at least from a lived experience, there's so much meaning and significance and wisdom in the body. And uh, I think that I, if I, I, I would guess that not, not that I know anything about neurology or science or anything, but I would guess that some of that cognition is really happening in the body and not just the like brain in the head. And, you know, that's just a guess, but I think that the body is doing a lot more than we tend to think it is and uh that there's a lot of information and knowledge and even wisdom there and the more we can access that the better and the images and talk are both sort of up here and they're operating on a different level and there's like value to that as well because those both have um maybe even for like communication and transfer or transmission of knowledge like it's hard for me to transfer the meaning of like a feeling around my stomach for example to you i have to use these words but um i think in terms of like depth of meaning and significance the body really has the trump card there yeah this is um slightly related to uh my get like so in in the kind of the subconscious and, and stuff like so I guess the way I think about it is like the more uh, like you know talk and stuff then it's sort of like a smaller slice of like life or content or whatever and so um, and so when it comes to like uh, subconscious stuff or like the, the the body introspection stuff like whatever like you know if, if we're dividing it up into two instead of three which we might do but um, that's like where all of the like all of the context lives and so like all of the meaning and like all of the connection and like the 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 significance as in uh this is related to that and related to this and not related to that except in this way and and so on and so like the smaller you kind of get to uh the less kind of rich it is and the less kind of like all connected and so and also i, I imagine that's like where all of the connections happen as well so like like you, you connect it to different ideas and it's like ah and so also it's where the create uh, creativity happens and so like and so that that also kind of has this like bubbling kind of um uh, thing of of like richness and like uh, if you stop being creative then then I think you kind of become a vegetable as well because you can't even like you know even even me speaking right now is a kind of a creative act and so yeah so that's why uh whatever the whatever the question was that's that's the answer for me uh-huh uh-huh huh um can you say that again just like as simply as possible because I, I think I followed but I want to make sure yeah. I'm understanding you correctly so the the inexplicit um ideas you probably don't want to talk about them like ideas but like content or like um subconscious is where all of the context is all of the connections to different ideas and also where creativity is and and were you implying that that's in the body but then the like verbal and images are in the mind I think um, so. Uh, I'm not like I, I'm. I'm not kind of studied in the biology of whatever, or or mm -hmm. even like computer science, which is probably also relevant. Uh, my current guess is that uh, the brain uses the body, like the, the brain needs some kind of like sense sensory organs and stuff um, to do whatever the thing is that it's doing, and then it probably like lives in the brain uh, and uh, like but like probably needs to have some connection to some sensory thing but also i don't know uh subjectively uh it does feel like it's in the body and so like in a kind of useful sense then we associate it with like having like association with like you know my, my chest or my my gut or whatever hmm. this sort of came up in relation to art and i'm curious if this conversation makes you think about or reflect on art and the significance of art differently at all
I've been recently getting more into um, the like so the types of art that I never used to get into so like I, I always was this kind of very like analytical realist kind of artist and then more recently I've been looking into abstract art and into this sort of uh, expressionism and into vibes and um, and and seeing some like like art that again like is not like fully representational except that it's representing a vibe and like and th that it, it's like evocative and that it can kind of like make you feel things or make you kind of think things or, or make connections in your own mind so um so okay i feel like that's a connection but like i don't have the explicit words for why <laughs> for me it's it's making me think that like art is a vehicle to both understanding myself better and also maybe even to expressing myself better. Like I, I am very curious about ways that I can use art in my creative projects and, or even create art that works for my creative projects. And um, that it's both like a, a way to, yeah, understand myself better as I am and mm. also to express myself better to others. And uh, yeah. For, for looking at art or for making art yourself? Uh, looking would be for understanding myself better and then uh, making would be for expressing, although maybe also making it would help me understand myself better as well. Um, but I was thinking more along the lines of like noticing what I like or what I don't like or uh, what I'm drawn to and why. And mm. uh, but, but even the process of making art myself would be something that could do the same process of like what I'm drawn to creating or how I create it or that kind of thing. I think I, I, I've never viewed art in a kind of fundamentally different category from any other creative endeavor, including science. Mm -hmm. And so like, and, and this is another kind of like um, Popperian thing where like, I think a lot of people think of science as this thing where there are like specific answers and, and that you follow this kind of mechanical process to, to get at those answers. And you have to have a lot of like this grunt work and stuff. Um, like not everyone thinks that, but I think like that's kind of uh, like there's art, which is creative and then science, which is like problems. Uh, whereas I think it's all like creative and it's all problems. And so like when I think of art in, in this way, I guess like the difference with art is that you are, it's a bit more like engineering than it is like physics. Like you're creating something, you're making something that didn't exist before. And so like there is something of you of your ideas in it instead of like just looking at, at what already exists. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think this whole exploration defies a previous way that I was conceiving of it. That's maybe not quite the one you're describing, but I'm not even sure what it is exactly. It's, it's just, I, I noticed that I wasn't really very interested in art previously and now it's like quite interesting to me and I'm still, chewing on why, but this conversation has sort of shed light on why it might be. Interestingly, I never, like, uh, when I was young, I never liked art galleries. Like, I never, like, actually, I think it was in fairly recent years that I, like, noticed, I don't know, what, what was it? Um, like, when I was young, I never kind of saw the point, I guess. And then, and then when I got into, like, actually kind of art making, uh, I was interested in them mostly to the extent that I could understand the techniques that were used and like I could see the skill and I could see like you know what is this like how is that light working and stuff but like in terms of like feeling things and like getting moved by art like I didn't really have that until I don't know probably a few years ago or something or mm. I probably had that like in ways that I didn't notice like when with uh, particular types of like uh, I don't know like when I was a, a teenager I really liked anime and like there was probably some like fan art and that that sort of thing that like I did uh, get like you know I, I really liked consuming like certain types of art but I was kind of thinking of it as a different thing um, so yeah so it's interesting like yeah like what what is that kind of taste for art and like um, yeah there's a kind of a certain type of openness and a certain type of like connection that you need in order to uh like not write off like the the vibe side of art like to actually like feel things uh like like to look at something and then have it like affect you and stuff instead of like to look at it and it's like yes this is good or bad or like yes it, you know it, it's done that hmm. Hmm. 
it's a bit like like learning how to have a conversation with a person i think hmm. uh, i can imagine but can you say more about that like um like when i think of uh looking at, at uh, like a very vibes heavy um piece of art it feels like it's almost like it's the same muscle as empathy so like when I when I'm speaking to you and I'm kind of like you know more kind of in connection with you then then there's this kind of like vibe thing that's happening and like more information is kind of being like transmitted sort of like like subconsciously or whatever and then um but like if I were in like an explaining mode where like I'm going to tell you what critical rationalism is and it is this and that and, and there's this kind of like like a, a wall that, that kind of comes up mm. and then it's the same with 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 art with like yeah like before I used to look at abstract stuff as like, yeah, you know, I don't get that. Like, you know, probably I could make that like, you know, whatever, uh, or like before I could draw. Um, and, uh, and now it's more like, yeah, it, 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 it it's like a switch. It, it feels very much like the same muscle as empathy. Hmm. What do you, so, is that so your before, experience? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, there are certain, a lot of the art that I'm drawn to is very like symbolic or like has very obvious kind of images in it. But there is there is a lot of art that I like that isn't like that. And it, uh, I can see what you're talking about it, but being more like vibes. And when I, I think I maybe know. I haven't exercised this muscle as much as I might, but like when I stop to, I can be like, oh yeah, this is kind of the impression that it makes on me. Yeah, maybe, maybe what it is is, um when you have that channel open of like letting stuff affect you and like mm. letting stuff change you. And maybe maybe that's what empathy is as well. That's interesting. Mm. Uh, as opposed to like just being like yes, no, or good, bad or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think that that is experientially? Like how do you experience letting things in or not? Um, it's definitely more uh, kind of like on the like bodily physical level I don't know whether that's just because I'm now like very practiced in focusing and like whether like I think before um if I did do the letting open at least subjectively I would have felt like kind of like glitter in my head or something and now I feel like kind of glitter sort of throughout mm. um there's a kind of yeah there's a there's an excitement there's a kind of like uh almost like kind of creative energy a sort of like uh, a wonder like you know where is this going to go next mm. Mm. So there's, uh, this isn't exactly what you're saying literally in words, but I got a sense from hearing you talk about it of like, you're keeping your awareness open, you're feeling your body and there's kind of a mental attitude of curiosity and wonder and interest. Yeah, um, awareness open. Yeah, like at least at least to a certain extent, like it, it at least has to kind of include you, I think mm. like if, if you're the, or like the painting or whatever. Right, um, right, right. That makes sense. Interesting, interesting. And then like wherever that painting or person kind of goes as well. So it's like awareness that kind of like, cause like you can kind of get lost like in a person and then completely like zone out like the rest. Um, and so like, I don't, but I think it's something, I wonder if it's like awareness flexibility or something. Like if, if someone indicates like, yeah, and then this thing exists, then like being available to go there. Hmm. Hmm. I'm also aware of there being like, possibly like a developmental aspect to it. Like I just looked up today um, that I came across some time ago that there's like, well, there's lots of different models of adult development, but that I found one a while ago that's like specifically a visual or aesthetic or art focused adult model of adult development where like people, the way that people relate to a piece of art is discernibly different when they're at, you can kind of see it in terms of like stages of the way that they conceptualize or feel about or talk about uh, a piece of art. But it can happen at different ages or? Yeah, I have to do more research on it, but like, yeah, that it would happen at different stages of development for different ages. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think in general with adult development, it's like not necessarily tied to specific ages. And in fact, there's like no necessity that someone go through, go through all of the stages, but that someone could progress through them and uh, mm -hmm. get to higher stages. and. That's certainly been my own, like looking back on it, that matches with kind of this shift that I'm going through now where like before I was like, mm, art, like I don't 
I just didn't feel that drawn to it or like at times I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's pretty or I do like this or I don't like that or I could tell you about what I thought about a certain piece, but it, it didn't really call to me in a certain way. And now I'm seeing like new potential for what art can mean and what it can show me about myself or the ways that I could express myself in the world. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm somewhat skeptical of um, like developmental stages just because I think you can uh, you can often like learn th things at different times and then it's kind of more about like what you're interested in like to which thing you're kind of going to get into I do think that there is something like uh, a, like a logic of the situation or a uh, like background knowledge that you'd need to have for then this step to make sense mm. or like you know it, it's it's difficult to like I don't know if you can learn calculus without algebra or something like that like there's some things that kind of logically come before others and so I can see that being a thing but uh, in general, I don't know, in, in general, like my intuition around people is that they are like, you know, very wildly different and that they can learn like different things at different times. And then it all depends on like what they're interested in. And the kind of the idea of stages is sort of like more based in like the framework of, uh, you know, like, like at school, you learn this and then you learn that. And, then, and, and that just doesn't like need to be uh, the case. Mm -hmm. So yeah maybe but like I, I think like if, if you think of stages as more like what makes sense to come uh one after the other or like at what point in your life does this thing become relevant then yeah I'd be on board with that hmm. Hmm. interesting interesting huh yeah I mean, that just makes me really curious about how you see people and see yourself and see other people and what kinds of differences you notice or are attuned to um yeah uh how do you how do you experience that like people being so different like what, what do you what do you notice about people yourself others etc one thing is like whenever you have a a sort of a sufficiently deep conversation with someone then like like you find kind of aspects that like like things about them that you would have never expected and so there's a kind of I mean, like if you're just kind of going through life on, on autopilot and you're kind of, you know, interacting with people in, in cursory or superficial ways, then you might not get to those. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just, I have like, uh, I really, I, I love people. Like people are great. Like there's a kind of, um, I sort of feel like the in infinite potential of people, I guess, uh, at least when I'm like not on autopilot or whatever, which, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how different in feeling that is to just like being a kind of like like optimistic pro person like you know like physically phenomenologically or whatever um but there's a kind of yeah i don't know there's like a kind of a a, a curios a curiosity or i don't know uh, does that at all answer the type of thing you're asking definitely I feel like I mean, this is a, a type of question that i don't usually <laughs> like it's kind of a yeah yeah it's a super broad question but it definitely answers it um I noticed that in this conversation, like I, how to put this, there was a way in which I was asking you discursively about certain ideas. And then as the conversation unfolded, it became, you know, like non-coercion or uh, things like this. And then uh, as the conversation unfolded, it became clear to me the like level at which these ideas are sort of built into the structure of the way you approach your life or the way that you live and I got the sense of like this intuition that um as I get to know you better and better I'm going to like see more and more ways in which that's true about the way that you live your life that's like like okay I, I knew that you try to live this way intellectually like I, I intellectually I under, understood this but I'm just going to see it at deeper and deeper levels yeah yeah I feel like I feel like just by having this conversation I'm making those connections a lot more myself and also kind of like uh, I feel more uh, something like more availability to to connect them and to sort of like be more like integrated or something like mm -hmm. I kind of like like I, again like I knew kind of intellectually about a lot of these connections like between critical rationalism and then all of the other but it's been it's been a long time since uh, I kind of went into like like it's been like what like tw I want to say at least 15 years since I first like started like getting into this stuff mm -hmm. and uh, thinking about like authoritarianism and and whatever and um, 
And so a lot of it is just kind of like so background that I kind of haven't, but like actually actively connecting is sort of like, I don't know, I'm like, oh, cool. Like they are connected. Like I, I now see like why post rats might be interested in this. Um, mm. So that's, that's all cool. Mm. I'm happy that uh, it's connecting some dots for you as well, because it's certainly been for me. Um, uh, yeah, I have uh, what, maybe one other question I'd love to ask you if, if you have time. Um, yeah. Uh, how to put this. Yeah, I, I noticed, well, I'm curious about what your approach is to your online presence of like, you know, I know you have a lot of different accounts online and you're on Twitter and uh, you have a YouTube channel and stuff like that. And I'm curious how your online presence, your blog, your Twitter, your YouTube channel relates to, or how, how you think of it in, in relation to your own uh, explorations and curiosities and attempts to solve the problems that you're interested in. One thing, so one of the reasons that I have a lot of different Twitter accounts, so originally it was like, well, uh, I have multiple interests and kind of multiple sides of myself. So like I'll have like a philosophy account and then like art is kind of like a completely different community and completely different set of interests. So I'll have an art account. Um, and then and then at some point I wanted to post in a kind of more sort of free way um, and like put, try like posting more like silly things and, and stuff. But I think there was probably like stuff about video games originally. And so I made this Metaluli account where I could just like, I could just shit post. Um, and then that kind of took, like that slowly took on a life of its own. Like I didn't kind of publicize it um, uh, initially at least. And then I started thinking like, ah, oh, yeah, but that, that, that tweet is related to my, my main account. And so I'll just like retweet that. And then kind of the, now there's a lot more. Um, and now, and uh, like that, that itself has been quite interesting because it's allowed me to kind of explore a different uh, like side of myself or a different part or, or whatever. Um, and, and they've both affected each other, like like both of the, the two accounts. So like uh, like I'm a lot more kind of free on my uh, Reason is Fun main account now because I've had this kind of like exploring sort of playing on, on uh, Metaluli. Um, what was the original question? It was like quite broad. And so I'm, I'm trying to think what to say about just, that. Just how do your online accounts, both on Twitter and YouTube and your blog relate to your explorations and interests? Yeah, but so there's there's a kind of um, a way that I use different Twitter accounts to kind of explore different like like parts of personality and like different ways of being. Like I I, I kind of learned to be like I think I learned I think probably my focusing improved by uh, doing this meta Luli stuff where I was like gut posting and I was like kind of like trying on this like typing things without thinking like non doing typing and and that sort of stuff. And so that has been really cool as a kind of like, a, it's its own psychotechnology. Um, like, I don't know why more people don't have alts, like alts are great. Mm -hmm. um, and then everything else, like, I don't know. Uh, yeah, like uh, trying to find like-minded people, community, trying to like share ideas, like trying to get things clear in my own mind, that kind of thing. Hmm. When we spoke recently, I, I mentioned uh, that I got the sense that we both you know, you, you had asked me what I value and care about, and I had asked you this, and uh, I got the sense that we both really value something like if there's something that we learn about and we've mastered to some extent or done sufficient research on that we really value, like putting our work out there so that other people can benefit from the work that we've already done. Um, it, does that describe your experience? Yeah, I, I really like um, finding some uh, important but explained badly or too technical or something like bit of, of knowledge that's out there and then like finding a way to make that accessible for people. So I, yeah, I don't always succeed at like, you know, not having critical rationalist jargon in my tweets, but I try to um, make things sort of understandable for people. And, and I really like, yeah, like like passing down stuff and like making it easier for, for the next person. Like, mm. you know, it, it took me this amount of time in order to like learn this, but actually if I just known this in the beginning, I could have like sidestepped all of that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, 
I think that that really, um, yeah, again, this is just sort of an intuition or a hunch, but I've just had the sense from this conversation and uh, our previous conversations of uh, almost, um, that a lot is possible there, that if you and I are able to sort of bridge our existing interests and sort of have mutual understanding that there might be a kind of shared exploration that would be possible of new territory and that that kind of thing is really cool. exciting to me. So teach, uh, teach me to meditate with, <laughs> without it going wrong. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. Uh, well, we can definitely talk more about that. Um, yeah, but I really appreciate you taking the time to answer my questions at such length. And from that perspective of what I was just sharing, like really feel like there's a lot more shared context and uh, mutual understanding here. So I really appreciate yeah, you taking the time. Yeah, this has been awesome. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Lily. Yeah, thank you.